Um, yeah, we are um, at an operating systems conference, so I guess um, yeah, we are doing operating systems work, so I'm going to present this on our system. So I put this together just over the last weekend, so please bear with me if there are any technical difficulties, but at least I will, I will try to run it. So, um, so this is now a normal laptop booting from USB. Um, I think that laptop booting now the Gnode OS um, running on the Nova micro hypervisor, which is basically a kernel, um, which is really tiny. So it's just 10,000 lines of code. And on top of that, we have built our custom OS infrastructure. So, ah, okay, here we are. So I have a small slide pro slides program here. Um, I can start it here. And I will go back to it uh, during the, t the talk. So, yeah, our system is called Gnode, and I will talk about uh, why, we, why we created it in the first place, what is the motivation. Then in the second part, I will give you um, the really high-level idea of the architecture, the primitives. Let me see if I can connect this slightly better. So, and then uh, um, I will show you some examples. Um, so first, why have we started to do this? So when I started working on operating systems in 2002 um, at a university back then, I was faced with a couple of kind of universal truths that seemed to be set in stone. One of them is that high assurance does not fit well with scalability. So in domains where high assurance is needed, like in avionics or in systems that need to be highly available or highly secure, you don't want to have complex systems. So people in these areas prefer to use kernels that are in the order of a few thousand lines of code, like isolation kernels, that partition the system into, into rigid partitions that are uh, uh, defined at compile time, basically. So the, so the trusted computing base for the keeping those subsystems isolated is just a few thousand lines of code. But on the other hand, there are a lot of applications where you want to be scalable. So like on a phone or on, or on a... On, a, on embedded devices. Um, so you want to update your applications, you want to reassign resources during the lifetime of the system, and you can't do that with those kind of isolation corners. So this seems to be a contrast. And I've, when looking at the complexity of systems today, if I am using, for example, a Thunderbird and the Enigma plugin to sign an email right now on Linux, I have to live with this kind of complexity. I have to trust the kernel, obviously, which is Linux, I have to trust all the kernel modules, all the drivers, the X server plus the desktop environment and all the processes that are running besides. So like the little clock in the corner of the screen and so on. So this accumulates to basically millions of lines of code that could compromise my private key. And so that's, that's real uh, frightening, I think. And what are the problems with, the, with that? So of course, if you have a lot of code, there's a high likelihood for bugs. So the code may break somewhere in the system. This might be uh, just unfortunate. So the, the vendors try to address this using, by delivering security updates. But, on, but if you have direct attackers, like in the last years, we have those kind of NSA scandals uh, around. If you have really someone with an incentive to compromise the system, this huge complexity gives you a huge attack surface. So, and there is actually no way to circumvent things like zero-day exploits in current generation operating systems. The only cure to this problem is to drastically reduce the attack surface, to drastically re reduce the complexity. The second um, kind of um, um, conflict seems to be the accountability of resource usage and the utilization of resources. So today in systems like on Linux, we try to get the most out of the hardware, to utilize the hardware as much as possible. And this kind of topic, accountability of resources, is just uh, kind of dropped. And what does it mean? It means that in the system, there are several services running, like the X server that provides windows to the clients, or the, the TCP IP stack in the kernel. And those services consume resources but they consume the, those resources on behalf of their clients. So the clients can open windows, and the, the X server has to pay for those windows. And this opens a huge amount of denial of service attacks, obviously. And current generation systems can't deal with that. And if you look at Linux, for example, how resource management is implemented there, Linux tries to pretend that there's an unlimited amount of memory, that's an unlimited amount of uh, network bandwidth, and so on. 
and it tries to keep up this illusion as far as possible. It tries to swap out pages and it has a lot of complexity implemented just to keep this illusion um, up. So this, of course, is again increasing the complexity and it actually, in the end, cannot solve the problem. So if we actually run out of physical resources, if the swap partition is full and the memory is full, we end up in a situation like that. And if you have dependable systems, we don't want that. We don't want to have the kernel choosing one particular process and just kill it. And the next uh, kind of conflict seems to be that security does not fit well together with ease of use. Security seems always to be a pain. You have to remember passwords. Our configuring SA Linux is so complicated, so ah, we don't turn this on and so on. So security seems to be always painful. And this seems to be a kind of um, yeah, empirical evidence for that. So, but there are technologies out there for many, many years, actually de decades, that address all those uh, problems, all those conflicts. So microkernels can, uh, can reduce the complexity of kernels. We know that for many years. We know how to split software, large software, uh, into small pieces so that their critical parts can be run independently from the non-critical parts. Capability-based security promises to make security easy. And I, get, I believe that it's, this is the case. And with virtualization, we could bridge the gap between today's systems and a new generation of operating systems. But somehow, during all those years, nobody came up with an idea how to combine them, how to compose those technologies into one coherent picture to build a general purpose OS. And with Gnode, we think that we have found a formula how to combine those. And to put it in one picture, uh, this looks like the architecture of Gnode. Um, basically, the system is structured as a tree. So we know trees from Unix uh, uh, processes, but this tree is different. In this tree, the relationship between parent nodes and child nodes is an ownership relation. So parents own their child nodes. And that's really important. Ownership means two things. First, the parent has to uh, be responsible for the child. So the parent has to provide the resources for the child. It has to uh, uh, take some of its own budget of resources and can use these uh, resources to form new subsystems. And on the other hand, ownership means control. So the parent is in the position to decide what the uh, child can do, what the child can see, uh, what uh, the lifetime of the child, so it could actually uh, destroy the child at any time. So this is a really strict and strong relationship. And this relationship can be built to build a, a, a system as a, such a hierarchy. And now with such a system, we can for each component specify what other components are critical to its to its uh, working, like for this component, it has to trust its chain of owners, so the chain of parents, obviously, because they own the component. And it also has to trust a service that it uses in the system. For example, if this is a file system, it needs to trust the file system, but it doesn't need to trust another subsystem. And now if we have this kind of uh, componentized way of, of looking at the system, we can specify the trusted com computing base for each individual application individually. And this allows us to implement security critical parts with just a few thousand lines of code of TCP complexity and have large complex subsystems running just beside. And of course, yeah, large complex subsystems could be virtualization, virtual machines, it could be drivers ported from Linux like we did for uh, TCP IP or USB. Yeah, this was the starting point, the idea. And over the years now, we have developed this idea into a kind of framework, a kind of uh, development kit to build customized operating systems out of. And this, I will just give you this idea how this kind of is looking like from 10,000 feet. Yeah, it consists of, of course, of a kernel. So normal operating systems have a kernel. In our case, our framework uh, goes a different route. We, uh, we enable the framework to run on different kernels. So you can use Gnode actually on eight different kernels. Linux is among, of the, among them, but we are focusing really on the L4 family of kernels, like the Nova hypervisor here, or the Fiasco kernel. We have an own kernel for the ARM platform as well. And on top of these kernels, we have a couple of device drivers. So these are the individual components, each running in user space. And these drivers cover most of the things that we actually need right now. Some drivers are ported from, from other systems, like Linux. Some drivers are written, uh, written from scratch. Then there are components that are runtime environments, which basically are components that host other components as child processes, like virtual machines. 
and um, ah, I will give you some examples later on. And of course, we have to um, to some, somehow provide single physical resources to multiple uh, subsystems sometimes. So, for example, we have multiple applications wanting to use the network. So there are resource multiplexers that take one physical resource and turn it into multiple virtual resources. And then there are quite a huge amount of protocol stacks and this is actually a point where RAMP comes into play. So, for example, right now I'm using a RAMP kernel here for accessing the file system on the, from the USB stick, another instance of RAMP to access the, uh, SATA, uh, the file system on the SATA drive. So we are using actually the work of Anti uh, to, uh, to, uh, to build the system. But there are other protocol stacks, like a TCP IP stack from Linux ported to Gnode and so on. And then, of course, we, there are applications that are using this infrastructure. So now this gives you a kind of idea that we, this is like a Lego, Lego set. You can take this kind of components, put them together in interesting arrangements, and build uh, interesting systems out of them. So let's uh, take a, a slight look under the hood. So uh, one fundamental idea behind the architecture is to use capability-based security. And I will just explain this idea in a minute. Um, basically, a comp um, when a component is created, it has no permissions at all. It is, it is just created by the parent process. It's up to the parent to, allow, to uh, populate this new component mit with uh, code, data, and the capabilities to uh, let the component interact with the outside world. And such a, such a, such a uh, authority to interact with another part outside the component is called a capability. A capability is a token, basically, and if you, it's similar to maybe a reference to an object, but this token refers not to a local object, but this object can be anywhere in the system, in any other component. And once a process um, has uh, gained access to such a capability, because the parent provides this, uh, it can, of course, use this, it can, it can invoke the capability, make a kind of function call to this object, or it can also pass it to other components that it already knows. So it's very natural, it's a very natural way to delegate authority throughout the system. And we use this to, to establish the, the relationships between those components in the tree. So this is an example where the, the root of the tree spawned a process, the init process. The init process in turn spawned two subsystems, a GUI and a user session. This one spawned another subsystem, the user session. And the red arrows de uh, denote this kind of ownership relation. And now the protocol is basically uh, has two parts. One part is that a, a component can just announce that it implements a service. So this is basically this GUI is just telling its parent, ah, I'm actually a GUI. And the second part is that components can uh, ask, politely ask the, the parent to uh, uh, create a session to a service. In this case, the user application sends a message to its parent, so the only connection point to the outside world is the parent, basically, to create a GUI session for it, and it can attach some arguments to the session, and these are kind, uh, kind of construction arguments. And now this request comes up to this component, and the user session now has to decide what to do with the request. It could just deny it, it could hand out a GUI session that is implemented in here, it could also provide uh, or forward this GUI session request to another child that might be sitting here. But in this case now, it decides to delegate this request up uh, down the tree. So it asks its own parent in the name of the, if it's of the user application to create a GUI session. And when doing so, and that's the interesting part, the user session can modify those session construction arguments. And that basically means that this user session can impose its policy on this session. It's really stronger than this one, and it can, for example, enforce that the label used for the window has a specific name. So it can override policy. And in fact, each of the nodes that are sitting in between the, the client and the server can impose their policy on the sessions. And now the init process is in the same situation. It also has to take a policy. In this case, it, uh, in this case uh, the init process uh, instructs the GUI uh, subsystem to create a new session. Again, it can impose its policy. You, now you see that the input argument has changed. And as a result, a new session object is created over here. And the capability to this object, so the pointer to this object, basically is passed back the call chain to the user application. And now the user application has this capability to talk directly to the, to the GUI. So 
for the normal high bandwidth communication, there is a direct link now. But the policy that, that was accumulated across the, uh, um, with the, along the route here, it's now attached to this object. It's attached to this session. So uh, I al already said that the parents have to act act uh, assign physical resources to their child processes. In some cases, this is too rigid. So there are, for example, servers where you don't know in advance how much resources they need. It depends on the lifetime of the server or on the client behavior. And so in GNOTE, it's possible to actually trade physical resources. So the idea is that a client can, uh, can attach a, 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 a budget of its own resources to a session request and basically pay the server for a service. So you have a kind of uh, economic system uh, that, uh, for, for dealing with resources. And this, uh, this basically removes this denial of service problem. So now let me, let me show you some examples. So the first example of using Gnode is to use it as a hypervisor platform. So here in this case, we have this low complexity Nova hypervisor. It's about 10,000 lines of code. Then we have the Gnode based system, which is in the same order, maybe 15,000 lines of code. A few resource multiplexers and device drivers that are each running in a different user space protection domain. And then we have a virtual machine monitor that contains hugely complex code to provide the device models to uh, unmodified guest OS. And there are actually different VMMs that we have on Gnode. Um, one of them was, was uh, realized in the, during the last year, which is VirtualBox, ported from Linux to this architecture. And just let me show this to you. So I'll hide the slides now for a minute and uh, start VirtualBox. So in this version, it's, uh, it's still quite young. It's not uh, optimized yet, but it's, it shows that, it that it's working. It uses hardware virtualization. So the Nova hypervisor provides us with uh, access, access to hardware virtualization capabilities. But everything you see here is running basically in user mode. It's just a normal application. It's not, not, nothing special. And if you look at a hypervisor platform like KVM or like Zen or, or like, like um, VirtualBox on Linux, you have a trusted computing base of uh, hundreds to millions of lines of code for keeping those virtual machines isolated. But here, you only have to trust these couple of thousand lines of code, and you can, ha you can be sure that those VMs are actually isolated. They cannot talk to each other. So and that's an orders of magnitude st more strict than what we have in the current generation OSs. So what you see here is Windows actually working somehow, and we can, um, I, don't, I know it's so proficient with this, System, I can, I guess I can click here, yeah, and I think ah, there are some videos. So you think you see that you can actually use this for for it's not it's not you it was, it's not lightning fast, but it's actually usable, and uh, we are still in the process of optimizing it. So this is basically the the first proof that it that it's working. And just to give an, a number, this virtual box code that we pulled it over to the plat platform. Is, about, is more than 300,000 lines of code and it's just working fine here in this scenario. So, um, so I will just uh, shut it down again. So I have to properly do this so that it will work the next time as well. <clears throat> and I can now safely remove this subsystem over here. So the next, uh, the next uh, example is using Gnode as an OS-level virtualization platform. So right now we had executed a full OS, uh, and um, this is quite complex, and also not as, uh, it, it's, it takes a lot of resources, but there's an alternative, and <clears throat> here we have done the experiment to, cre to create a kind of Unix kernel, but as a user-level component that provides the Unix system core interface as an RPC interface. So this is the Nux server, which is providing an, an VFS and some simple facilities to let it talk to the outside world. And um, it provides this kind of Unix uh, functionality to a child rendered around on, on top of that. And here we have unmodified GNU software that's just recompiled again, uh, and linked against the FreeBSD libc. And we have, have a small plugin here that translates FreeBSD system calls to this RPC interface over here. And the idea here is to have many of those small uh, environments for different tasks, like one for editing source code, one for compiling, although they are, they are really lightweight. They should be f as fast to start as a shell normally. And so I can just show this to you. Um, hiding the slides again. 
and starting this nukes instance over here. And you see that the longest uh, time is actually de fetching the, the binaries from the USB stick, and then it's just there. And here we have a file system that's just configured for this instance, and you see in the in the bin directory, there are, there's the usual core utils, bin utils. We can actually run the Gino toolchain within this environment. So it's fairly, I would not say complete, but it's sufficient for our use cases. And here, in this case, I have made a, a special file system visible to the Nux instance that allows us to even uh, interact with Gnode in some way. So, for example, I can go into this config and uh, configure the backdrop application a bit. So for example, if I want to remove this, uh, this blue sticks over here, I can just, uh, I can just uh, change this line and write the file and you see that the background changes. So I can actually, you see that there is a uh, level of integration where you can use all the nice Unix software in this environment and it can be closely interact uh, with the uh, Gnode applications. So I will restore the background picture because it looks nicer. So, and then I can kill this again. Um, so next example is uh, to run up co more complex applications on top of Gnode, and this is uh, the example of running a web browser, basically uh, um, using WebKit and Qt5, so quite huge application stacks. The TCP IP stack is directly linked to the browser, it's in this case LWIP, and yeah, I can first start the browser. Um, um, hiding the slides again, and start it here. So I have no real network connection right now, but I have some kind of demo pages prepared. Um, here you see that it fetches the Qt uh, lips from, from the USB stick, and now we see this, uh, this browser here, and it's actually using the normal toolkit, so if you have just all these nice widgets that are basically available, and you can port Qt5 applications pretty easily. And the nice thing here is, if you look at the file system visible for the, by the browser, and if I make all files visible, um, you see nothing. There's nothing visible. So, oh, oh I, so there's actually a font visible to the browser, but that's it. Yeah, the browser has no way to access any of the stuff that I have shown you. It, it cannot see our slides. It cannot see any, anything that I, I have shown you. And but we have an added, another twist, so we can actually uh, we can actually run Gnode as a pl browser plugin. So what you see here is just not a picture, but it's a Gnode subsystem as a plugin, and we can use it to, for example, start new subsystem over here and here. You see, the, and I can, and because it's just a normal Gnode subsystem, it can also run applications at full speed. So we can have this application running here, and it's just uh, the same as native ap uh, application performance. And the, uh, the, the cool thing here is that those browser plugins are still completely isolated from the browser. I can show this in this X-ray mode here. So you see that this is the kind of uh, pink domain and you have the yellow domain. So do, those two dom domains are completely isolated from each other. So when you, when you look at the architectural picture, you see how this works here. So there's the web browser. It, take, it fetches the plugin in the form of like a Tor archive from the web, or from, in this case from disk, and, and stuffs this into a loader session, which is in a different service over here. And this loader session now establishes this subsystem. So but after this subsystem is started, the browser does not even know what's in here. So it's, uh, it has provided the, or the original binary, and this could be protected using encryption or uh, signatures, of course. The loader has, is the parent of the subsystem, not the browser. So the browser has paid for it, but it does not know what's in there. So it's also not able to peek inside it. It cannot see the keystrokes that are going into the plugin, for example. And from the plugin's perspective, the plugin doesn't even know that there is a browser. It's just a subsystem that's running as a parent of the, of the loader. So you, this is just an example of how nicely you can arrange those existing components to build interesting system scenarios. Okay, let's uh, kill it again. Okay, to, to uh, finish the talk, I will just give a brief outline of our current focus. So right now, we are really going strongly in the direction to use Gnode as a day-to-day -day OS, so we are not there yet. So that's really our main ambition right now, to have everything in place that we need for development work. 
One thing that, for instance, uh, right, uh, Josef has, has been working on is wireless networking on the machines, putting the Intel wireless stack to Gnode. Then, of course, uh, we want to complement the system with a real capability-based user interface, which would be, uh, which I think is needed for this kind of system. We can't just port an existing desktop environment to Gnode. That would not fit. Then also we are looking at SEL4, of course, and doing stuff on, uh, on ARM virtualization, so to have the same architecture but use it on ARM and yeah. And yeah, and this is actually quite uh, well, uh, quite uh, mo motivated by this first point. We also need a kind of solution to set up this system in an easy way, like using packages. Okay, uh, that's basically it. Thank you for your attention.